We invite you into this space and ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us to bind us to our Lord Jesus Christ, that every thought, word, and work of ours may begin with you, and through you be happily completed through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to welcome everybody to this, our second in a series of three talks on gender identity. And tonight's talk is called Gender Identity and Child Development. I'm Father Sean Kilcally. I'm the Family Life Office Director here in the Diocese of Lincoln. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cody Hollist, who is Director of Marriage and Family Therapy, Associate Professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And Dr. Hollist has been a great friend to our work at the Family Life Office, especially when um, kind of looking for advice about different issues when it comes to marriage, family, and, uh, and child development. And a couple of our therapists at Catholic Social Services were actually in the program at University of Nebraska, and Dr. Hollis was one of their professors. So please help me welcome Dr. Cody Hollis. I was grateful that um, Father Sean um, talked to me and asked me if I would talk about this, because I, I was talking with um, Father Heeslip. Okay, I got to remember his name. I was talking with Father Heeslip before we we started, and sometimes it's a it's a good impetus. It's a good reason to have to review material and relook at what we're doing. And <clears throat> in my field, there isn't another body of literature that has changed more in the last five years than the way that we talk about and look at transgendered identity in, compared to any other area of psychology. And so <clears throat> this is a hugely growing and rapidly changing area. So it was a good chance for me to look at it. Just to tell you, the, I always hate these slides, these first slides of like, this is what my job is. So I always, not always, but I get to put what really is important to me. This is my family. I have five kiddos. Um, as you can see, one of them is biologically not mine. <laughs> my wife and I adopted our son from Brazil. Uh, we lived there for a year. I lived there for two years as a missionary when I was 19. And <clears throat> so Brazil's a really important part of our family. and. Now that I work at the university, I take students there. And um, last year, I took uh, about 20 students to Brazil. And there was three students that came up to me before we took the trip. And their, one of their mothers was there. And she said, OK, I'm only letting my daughter go if you make sure she gets to Mass on Sundays. And so we made sure that she made it to Mass so she could go and her mom was happy. And, um, so it's nice to be able to be in an institution in family studies that allows me to still bring in religion as an important part of people's lives and the way that they look at the world. And so I think important in this context is that I'm going to be speaking to you from an academic perspective. And at the same time, I want to be cognizant that there's other really important competing ideologies and ways of thinking about this that are important for us to consider. And so I think this about, you know, I'm a chaplain in the Air Guard. One of my fellow uh, chaplains is uh, Father Barnhill from Beatrice. And he's wonderful. Oh, you're Our from Beatrice. Yeah, you're a priest. Good. Well, tell him all. I'll tell him this weekend that you were here. So, we invited you to come along. Well, I'll tell him that you should have come. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a good opportunity for me to be here. All right. The first thing I want to talk about is language. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping is an outcome of our conversation today, and this is based really around the conversations I had with Father Sean prior to tonight, of you know what's kind of the objectives. And the way that I understand it is there's kind of two broad objectives of my presentation. And I hope that this is accurate because I already prepared for these two objectives. So if it's not accurate, I'm in real trouble. But the objectives would be 
how do we have a language that we can communicate with people outside of our religious and faith group about this topic? So how do we have a knowledgeable base to communicate or to build upon when we're doing things like advocacy and policies and community involvement? Um, just last week they had you know, something at the Capitol building, an activity at the Capitol building to look at religion in a public square. And so, you know, how do we interact with each other so we can communicate in a similar language? So one objective would be that, to kind of have a foundation of what's going on in the, in the public eye in regard to gender identity. And then the second one is how do we work with family members that are struggling with this or friends or neighbors or any other kind of loved ones. So there's kind of these two big objectives. Um, to get started with that, I think in both cases, we need to be able to communicate language. I see this so much when I work with couples. And actually, I like to work with adolescents much more than couples. <laughs> I really do, and it's sad that I'm the director of the family therapy program, and I really like adolescents and family therapy. Couples, there's another professor that does couples, and any <coughs> referrals I get for couples, I send them to him. Because my tendency when they're communicating in disastrous ways is to be like, seriously, you guys are really just beating each other up for nothing. And with adolescents, I can just say that, right? I can just say, come on, get real. And then they, you know, curse a few times and we move on. Um, but with adults, you have to be so careful about the concepts that you're using. And one of the things that I think is important is how do we start on common ground? So I have a quote that I really like from Thomas Jefferson. And so I'm going to read it. It's, you know, long. And I will pass these slides on to... Um, uh, Father Sean, so you guys can have access to them if there's content you want. So it says, I never saw an instance of one or two disputants convincing the other by argument. I've seen many on, the, on their getting warm, becoming rude, and shooting one another. When I hear another express an opinion which is not mine, I say to myself, he has a right to his opinion, as I to mine. Why should I question it? His error does me no injury. And shall I become a Don Quixote to bring all men by force of argument to one opinion? Okay? Now, if he stopped there, I would say that's really an important thing in terms of we, how do we stand for what we know to be right and communicate with people who are trying to stand for what they believe to be right that is different than ours. And he, he helps with this. And I think that this is fascinating the way that he finishes this statement. He says, in a fevered state of our country, and I think, you know, this was, you know, 200 years ago. <laughs> well, yeah, 210. So he's saying, in this fevered state of our country, and I think, you know, we're right there. Maybe 200 years later, but we're still, especially in this regard of um, gay, lesbian relationship, transgendered relationships, that's a very fevered topic in our country right now. No good can ever result from any attempt to set one of these fiery zealots to rights, either in fact or principle. Now, this is an important piece. They are determined as to the facts they will believe. Okay? They've decided which set of facts they want to believe. That's an important piece. Okay? In, the, in the opinions on which they will act, get by them, therefore, as you would by an angry bull. It is not for a man of sense to dispute the road with such an animal. Now, he's being tongue-in-cheek about this, but the message that he went on, and this was a, a letter that he wrote actually to his... Um, kind of younger cousin that I think married his daughter eventually. But he was trying to give him some advice in heading into politics. And how do you address discord? 
And one of the things that he talked about was language. And so I want to, before we really get into the meat of what the discussion outside of a religious context, how it's talking about transgendered identity and gender identity in, ge in general, I want to get some kind of um, foundation of language. Okay, so if we look at development and child development, it's important, even though, and you'll see here a bunch of names, Freud, Erickson, Piaget, Bronfenbrenner, there's a bunch of these people that have their theories of child development, most of which have some kind of categorical stages. The reality is, though, that development of children is not a event-based experience. It's a process that kind of has ups and downs, ebbs and flows, and the process isn't nice and neat and linear. And so the reason that we have so many ways of talking about child development is because it's this kind of difficult and challenging process. And so I want to make sure that we think about it in a process that's moving them from being completely dependent as a newborn. They can do nothing for themselves to the point when they are launched from our home in dependence and or independently and they're going off to do their own thing. Okay? One of the theories I do want to keep in mind because I think that it has a big overlap in what we talk about in terms of this issue of identity and that's attachment. And I'm not going to go into all of the like academic jargon from Bowlby's attachment. But attachment is just a way of talking about a healthy relationship between primary caregiver and child. Either parent, grandparent, primary caregiver and child. And attachment just helps us see that when the child, and there's really two outcomes from attachment. They learn to see who they are. They learn to, to, to understand their own identity from their relationship with their primary caregiver. And they learn to understand others primarily by way of the trustworthiness. Can I depend on other people? So they learn how to see themselves and they learn how to see others through this attachment relationship. Attachment is critical as we look at identity because a lot of identity development, especially in those early years, is built out of um, interacting with other people. We know what our identity is because we know what, or we know what our gender is because we know what somebody else's gender is. And we can make the link of what that means for us. Does that make sense? And so keep this in mind. Keep this attachment um, idea of how you understand yourself and others in mind because we'll come back to it. Okay? So some important gender-related development. Don't try to memorize any of this. This is way word heavy. I in intended it to be that way so you could have the slides later and have kind of a refresher. But the, the critical pieces though is kind of the process. So if you look at the process of recognizing gender, kids before the age of three or four, they don't really recognize what gender means. They can say mom, dad, girl, boy, but they really, before three-ish, they really don't have a concept of what that actually means, right? I mean, this is, this is natural, right? They, when you look at little kids, a two-year-old really doesn't care what makes a boy a boy and a girl a girl. They just, they just don't care. They're, developmentally, they're not there yet, right? So um, at four to six, they start to recognize behavior that's kind of gendered behavior. And they start to play around with this, right? Four to six-year-olds are the age, um, really three to six is the age where kids start to explore dressing like a boy and dressing like a girl in like play clothes, right? They do the same thing in terms of, I'm going to dress like a fireman, and now I'm going to dress like a policeman, and now I'm going to dress like a mom and a dad. That's how kids kind of explore roles and what their behavior is supposed to be like. And if you watch kids at this age, 
they're really good at, uh, especially the latter five or six year olds, they're really good at pretending like they are a certain thing, right? And they, you know, modify their language and they talk with a deep voice, I'm a dad now, you know? And they do those things to kind of explore what does all this mean? Um, and that's critically important for kind of understanding of gender. Um, but it's important to recognize that by the time they get to six to eight, they kind of, that's when they really first start to see gender as something that's stable. So before six to eight, and, some, and this is a wide range, but before that age, you can see that they will sometimes, you'll see a four-year-old sometimes say, I'm going to grow up and be a dad when it's a girl. A girl four-year-old will say, I'm going to grow up and be a dad when I get big. Or when I get big, I'm going to be a mommy, a little boy says. That's not any kind of gender identity confusion. That's just at this age, at this four to six age, gender isn't a concrete idea. Okay? It's not something that's stable. They can move in and out. That's why at this age, the gender of their friends doesn't make any difference. They don't care. A four-year-old doesn't care if their friend is a little girl or a little boy. At starting four, six, seven, eight, that's when they have really start to build gender-based or gender-driven friendships. Does that make sense? Can you see that in your interaction with kids? That at that age, they're really kind of, they just kind of play around with it. Okay? Now, this is driven by something critical. The ability to think abstractly. As adults, we take this for granted. I remember one time when my oldest was um, about four. She was four, and she was in this heated debate with one of her friends. And so I came over, and they were, you know, they were arguing. Heated debate is parents speak for they were fighting. Okay, and. <laughs> I get over there and I'm like, what's wrong, Malia? And she said, well, he has the sword and the dragon's going to kill me and I don't have a sword and he won't give me the sword. <laughs> and so I was like, Taylor, where's, do you have the sword? And he's like, yes. <laughs> and she said, see? <laughs> he had nothing in his hand, right? <laughs> and so in moment of accidental genius, I said, do you know what, Malia? I have a sword, too. <laughs> and I will give it to you. And she took it, and she was happy as a clam, right? Because now she had a sword to fight the dragon, too. Four, five, six, they cannot distinguish between imagination and real life. You've seen this, right? They think they are a princess or a firefighter. And abstract thinking is necessary to kind of differentiate between imagination and fact and fiction. Uh, before then, it just all kind of melds together. Abstract thinking is also necessary to link gender as a biological construct with identity, how we see ourselves and how we act linked to our biology. You have to have abstract thinking in order to be able to conceptualize it in that way. Does that make sense? Because otherwise, you can float in and out of this who I am too easily. Until you have abstract thinking, you can be something and imagine yourself as something else and imagine being something else. This is why gender identity or any kind of identity doesn't start when you're four and five they start to kind of get a concept of who they are. But it's not in the sense of, when I get big, I'm going to do X. Otherwise, we'd have all kinds of ballerinas and firefighters. And no other jobs would exist, <laughs> right? And so there's an important piece of growing up that allows you to think, OK, do I really want to be a ballerina? That's a lot of hard work standing on your toes. <laughs> Probably don't want to do that. Um, firefighters, that sounds really hot. 
I don't think I want to go into burning buildings all the time. You know, so it, we have to have abstract thinking to be able to do that. Okay? Now, identity development. Because before age eight or nine, kids can't think abstractly, they can't really develop a rooted sense of identity. Okay? This isn't, this isn't, I'm sure, news to anybody that during adolescence is the primary time people are developing their identity. Okay? The adolescence is about identity development. This is why adolescents are incredibly self-absorbed. Because innately they're trying to figure out who am I and what do I want to do, what do I want to be, what values do I want to have. And so because developmentally they need to figure themselves out, they really focus on themselves a lot. Any of you have adolescents? Yeah, I got a couple, three. And the world revolves around them. In fact, this week I was redoing one of their rooms, remodeling some part of their room. She comes in and says, you know, I know that you're doing this for me, but can I go to sleep on your bed? Because you're making a lot of noise. <laughs> like, seriously, I'm remodeling your room, and you want to sleep somewhere else or want me to be quiet. <laughs> right? And it's just, that's, it, that drives parents crazy. But it's part of this trying to figure out who I am. They have to be self-absorbed in order to figure that out. It's, it's an inevitable piece. So where do we long, belong? Who am I? Stuff like that. Any questions about that? How that plays out? Or hopefully you can kind of think about kids at different ages and how this might link together. OK, now I want to shift gears a little bit. And I want to talk about where um, not just problems come from, but I'm going to talk about it in terms of where um, characteristics of development come from. So the first is um, it's, it, this question of etiology. Where does behavior, emotion, psychological characteristics come from? This is that age-old nature versus nurture debate. Okay? And in the 40s, 50s, this was a big debate. Are we really just concerned about the genetic heritage of our children and that's what makes them great? Or is it about how we raise them? Now, r reality is we know that it's both and, right? And this hopefully isn't a news flash to anybody. That our biology plays a part in who we are, like you don't have any hair for some people. Um, it also affects how we do a lot of things, okay? So one of the things that's important is as um, family counselors or as human service people, we've had to figure out where do problems come from? Why are some people depressed and other people not depressed? And it's way oversimplistic to say, is this nature or is this nurture? To say, somebody is depressed either because of their biology or they're depressed because of their environment. It's really overly simplistic to say which one is it. It's even overly simplistic to say how are the two combined. And so in an effort to try to describe this, they came up with, um, and by they, I mean this has been a term that's been around for a long time, biopsychosocial spiritual. And it's a real big mouthful. But I think it's important, as you talk about gender identity and gender confusion, it's important to be able to think holistically about what can cause someone to have confusion about their gender. And it could have a piece of it that's biological. Right? We know that we come with, come and from the time we're little, we come with traits, right? Um, if you have more than one kid, or even if you have one kid, you can tell that some of them, by the time they're little, they're indignant and they're stubborn, and other kids are like, whatever, right? I don't have any of those, but I've heard they're great. <laughs> um, but personality is part of who they are, right? That's part of the biological makeup that they come with, okay? 
Psychological is stuff that's related primarily to trauma, attachment, a lot of that other um, things that go on in our head. Emotional, we can have problems that are based in emotions. If we have a family member die, we're going to be depressed. If we're not, there's probably something going on psychologically. If we have a really close member that goes through traumatic event, it's going to affect us. Okay, so, and then the other piece that I think is really important is there's some spiritual foundation too. If we engage in behavior that we believe to be inconsistent with our values, that's going to affect us. And so all these things come together to create challenges and problems. If we obsess about any one of those, we will miss the boat. And one of the things that I see most common when debates happen is people talking about different parts of this. And so I'll give you a great example. Discussions about where does gender identity challenges come from. There's a group that are going to say it's all biology. Biologically, some people, and you've heard this, Biologically, some people were born in the wrong gendered body. Okay, that's attributing the whole problem to the gender of the body that they have. That's saying it's all biology. Okay? Then there's other groups that are saying it's all psychology. It's what's going on in the person's head. And so what needs to happen when you're having a discussion in the community about this is you need to establish some common ground. So as you're talking to them and they're talking about transgendered individuals, what are they attributing the transgendered nature of that person to? Is it biology? Is it emotion? Is it psychology? Trauma? Is it spiritual? What is it? And then you can speak to the same levels of things. And um, towards the end, and I'm going to have to speed up because I'm talking too much. But towards the end, I want to go through a document that's produced by an organization that um, set the standards of care for transgendered health. They have set what they um, believe to be the standard of care for physicians and mental health providers. And I want to go through it so we can talk about some of these developmental characteristics and how consistent they're staying or not staying. Okay? But a little bit of... Um, Definitions first. Okay? Again, don't try to absorb all of this. One of the things I want you to notice is sex in terms of when we talk about sex as gender, not as a relational or a physiological, the act of sex. This is sex, the gender part. It isn't used anymore or isn't used very much, and that's probably good for us to all kind of absorb this idea that the term sex as it relates to gender can be too distorted in what it means. Because really the term sex was used because it related to the ability to produce children. And so the gender derivative of or the gender origin of sex as an identifier of gender male or female is really about having children. What role do you have in having children? Well, that idea of having children in the society we live in is a messy idea, especially when you mix it with, with the content of gender identity. Okay, so while it's clear in your mind, be careful of using the term sex as an identifier of gender. Gender is usually, um, and these all these definitions come from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Providers. So these are direct quotes out of that. And again, I'll pass this along to you. It's the legally recognized or lived role of the individual. Okay? I think the, the best thing to remember when somebody refers to gender is just, if you can think of it as gender is the legally recognized male or female of that individual. Okay? So 
biologically assigned gender. And this is, you have to catch yourself when you read this, because sometimes you'll read it like um, natal gender, which is the gender you're born with, or um, gender assignment. The gender you'll see people talk about, the gender that you were assigned at birth. And I often think, well, who assigned that? Do we really want to screw with who assigned that and tell them that they were wrong? But this idea of attributing assignment of gender to some ominous thing out there is kind of how a lot of academic world wants to talk about it. They don't want to talk about where the assignment of gender came from. They don't want to say God decided our gender. They just want to say gender assignment and it's kind of this ambiguous thing. So when you see gender assignment, be careful of how you are thinking of it. Okay? Gender identity is really what we want to talk about. It's how we internalize our own gender. The disorder connected with this is gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria says, I'm unsatisfied with my gender. I don't like my own gender. Um, and transgendered is just another way of referring to an individual who's dealing with gender dysphoria. You'll see transsexual a lot. Um, Currently, it's really only used in the medical. Physicians will use transsexual um, to kind of indicate somebody who has had the um, sex change operation. So if they've already undergone um, gender reassignment surgery, they will refer to that individual as a transsexual. Um, it's Historically, the term transsexual has a lot of um, misinterpretations and it was used as very condescending nature and so there was a lot of um, negative ways so just as a general rule it's probably not a good term to use as we talk about individuals who are struggling with their own identity and gender identity transsexual is a pretty acceptable term and gender identity is very acceptable and it communicates that kind of struggle with identity. OK? All right. Now, here's a slide with, with more definitions, just saying the same thing. This is from a medical journal. You'll see a lot of the consistency there. A couple of professional organizations, this um, World Professional Association of Transgendered Health, I'm going to review some of their materials. And I want to review their materials with you, and I will give you a copy of, of my notes on this, because I couldn't figure out how to put it in PowerPoint slides without being really, really verbose. So I'm just going to walk you through their standard of care and talk about some pieces of it, OK? Another um, important, uh, or another really good website is this website from the San Francisco Center of Excellence for Transgendered Health. The good thing about that website is they have kind of continuous updates as far as how the medical field is approaching, how the mental field is approaching the idea of transgender individuals and gender identity and gender reassignment. And so they're a really good source of information. Okay? All right. So treatment approaches. Um, there's, and this is from the, um, that world uh, professional organization. So they say that this is five steps. Okay? And this is the five steps for um, changes in adults. Okay? So diagnostic assessment with gender dysphoria done by a mental health professional. Psychotherapy and counseling, real life experience, hormonal therapy, and surgical treatment. Now, um, if I understand things from Father Sean well, one of the motivators for getting you all together about this topic has been the NSAA's decision about self-determined gender as it relates to participation in high school activities, right? Am I understanding that correctly? Okay. I see some nodding heads, so the rest of you can wake up and hopefully <laughs> your friends can fill you in. Um, 
so one of the pieces of that has been, um, and it was interesting, I was teaching my uh, practicum class last night. So I have all these students who are, you know, 20 to 25. And so I said, oh, you know, there's this NSAA new policy about individuals in high school being able to choose their gender and what, you know, athletic sport they want to play in. And these young students are like, that's great. That's great. I said, well, how do you operationalize that? How are you going to determine whether somebody wants to actually be of the other gender? Or they just think that they would make a better girls basketball player than boys basketball player. And so maybe they want to play for the girls team instead of the boys team. And this conversation was really interesting from that point because the students were saying, yeah, and what about the kid who's just kind of creepy and just wants to be on the girls team because he wants to be in the girls locker room? And how do you make sure that that's not happening? And so it, it was really interesting from this initial, this is what stance the NSAA is taking. They're like, yeah, that's great, to the operationalized, OK, well, what does this really mean? And backtracking, saying, this is kind of a mess. Okay, what is this really going to do to kids, and how do we deal with that? So I'm going to um, bring up an article. So this is from that World Health, this World Organization on Transgendered Health. Um, the reason I'm going to bring this up, and I'm going to give it, um, let... Um, Father Sean, pass it on to you. The reason I want to pass this on to you is because it goes line by line on what the policy of probably one of the most aggressive advocates for transgendered gay and lesbian rights. So this is the banner bearers for transgendered rights. Okay? Now, the, some of the things that they are going to talk about in here are in direct inconsistencies with NSAA's policy, which I think, OK, what does it tell me that this group that is the strongest advocates for go for gender reassignment is having some policies that are not very consistent with what NSAA said, go ahead and do this. Okay, It, it tells me that there's some problem with the way that it's being operationalized, even from this perspective of somebody who's a big advocate. Um, and what it tells us for those of you who aren't looking at this presentation in terms of how do you advocate for gender specific and from the spiritual side of this debate and the psychological and social side of this debate, <laughs> and not just the biology side. Remember the biopsychosocial, spiritual piece? How do you talk about it with people who are merely focused on the biology piece? And this group has done a nice job of laying out some ideas with some problematic steps in it. So we're just going to kind of go through that. So um, <clears throat> one of the things, and this specifically I pulled out, this is like a 120-page document. Obviously, we're not going to go through the whole thing. But I pulled out the piece that talks about adolescence because of the context of NSAA. Because we're just going to talk about that piece now. Okay, one of the things they point out is that there's a lot of dramatic developmental stuff that goes on during adolescence, right? News flash. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> okay. Now, there's here we're talking about differences between children and adolescents with gender dysphoria. Now, this isn't necessarily differences between kids who have Gender dysphoria, which remember is a struggle of gender identity. They, they just barely changed the name in 2013 from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria. They wanted to, to make it less pathological. So they changed it from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria. Now, really, that just made it more of a bizarre name and didn't do anything else. Um, but really what we're talking about here is gender identity confusion and struggle. The struggle that I, I want to 
I'm going to keep reiterating this kind of biopsychosocial spiritual piece. Because with individuals who are struggling with gender identity struggles, it's, there's a piece of it that's biological. There's a piece of it that's psychological. A lot of times related to attachment injury. A lot of times related to not being able to see themselves in a positive light. And they're kind of searching for ways to fix that. Okay, there's a social thing. And there's a spiritual piece. So it, it, we have to talk about it with all those pieces. Okay, so the, the first thing that they say is um, only a portion of the individuals who struggle with this persists into adulthood. Okay, gender dysphoria during childhood does not inevitably continue into adulthood. What does that mean? What's the so what there? What do you take from that? They, they don't know what they are. Yeah. And so if we are doing something that makes their confusion permanent, that's a bad idea. Okay? It also tells us that what they think they are now isn't necessarily what they're going to be when they grow up. And I think we can probably all look back at our adolescence and say, man, I am glad that's true. If we didn't end up being what we thought we were going to be as adolescents. If we did, we would have a whole lot of drug addicts in this world. Right? We would have a whole lot of serious problems. So it's what they're, as a foundational thing, what they're saying is not everybody who struggles with this as a kid is going to struggle with it as an adult. Okay, so already, as people that are looking at this in a terms of we need to be careful of this, we need to be careful of how much we pigeonhole someone who's a child or an adolescent and how much we say, this is just who you are, and we kind of force them to take a stand because that's, that's not what we do with all kinds of other things. We don't say to a, a seventh grader, what are you going to be when you grow up? You're going to be an engineer. Okay, you're stuck. I'm going to change your biology so the only thing you can do when you grow up is become an engineer, and I'm not going to let you change. Research of college students is about you know, six to seven times of changing your major. So clearly, we don't know what we want to do when we grow up. It's unfair to restrict someone based on a decision they made at that point in their life. So I think that's an important piece. And this organization, remember, this is a really, really agenda-driven organization. And they're acknowledging this. They're saying, be careful of how you interpret this. So the 6 to 23% of children who struggle with gender dysphoria go on to struggle with it as adults. Interpretation, 75% of the time you're going to be wrong. Between 75 and 94% of the time, you're going to be wrong if you assume that because this kid is struggling with their gender, that when they grow up, they're going to struggle with their gender. In the world of mental health, 75% is ginormous. If I could predict 75% of the adults that were going to struggle with depression, I would be rich. Because you cannot, there are very few things you can say at that level of certainty. So to, to recognize this is important. Okay? Um, and they have good studies that they cite showing this too. Now, here's another important thing. Sex ratios for each of these um, ages. If you look at children under 12, boys that think they're going to be, that they're the wrong gender. So boys who want to be girls versus girls who want to be boys. It's six to one. Boys who want to be girls, more. There's six more boys. There's six boys that want to be girls to every one girl that wants to be a boy. Now, from a biological standpoint, what these people have said is that's because it's prepubescent. At age 12, they've gone through puberty, and that's when it balances out one to one. So that's a biology answer. What might be a psychological, social, or spiritual reason why you would have a lot more little boys that want to be little girls, or that want to be girls, compared to little girls who want to be boys? Mothers. 
Who are all these little boys typically raised by? A woman. Okay, this, in my mind, this has way less to do with biology than it does to do with they're most connected with mom. That's where their primary attachment is. Okay, so is it any wonder then that there's a lot more little boys that want to be girls than girls that want to be boys? Not really. Okay? Um, so, again, when you're, when you're looking at this kind of stuff, what they've said is this points to a biological marker. As you have conversations in the community, you can say, no, think about all of the reasons why problems exist. It could be biological, but it could also be that they just spent the first 12 years of their life with their mother. And mom has a big influence. Okay, so again, an important piece. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to keep cruising through this. Children as young as two may show features that could indicate gender dysphoria. True or false? Absurdly false. Absurdly false. How many of you have seen a two-year-old dress up in clothes of the opposite gender? If you haven't, you've never been around a two-year-old. <laughs> right? Now, to say that because that two-year-old was wearing mom's high heels around the house is an indicator that that boy two-year-old doesn't know what his gender is, is, is crazy. That's crazy. Remember the um, developmental characteristic of abstract thinking. A two-year-old cannot think that abstractly. They just think, high heels look cool. And they sound cool when I walk on the hardwood floor. Okay, that's, that's what they're thinking. And they're also thinking, um, when I do play therapy with children, there are a few things that we use for dress up that are really critical. Glasses, hats, and shoes are super important. Okay, Why would those things be important? For one, two-year-olds typically don't wear glasses. So who wears glasses? Old people like us. right? So to put on glasses is a sign of maturity. It's a sign of dignity. Hats are the same thing. Hats let you try on different roles. Okay, so when we're talking about a two-year-old, they're exploring with all kinds of stuff. It doesn't mean they have gender dysphoria. And it is amazing to me over the last five years how many more phone calls I've gotten from parents that I don't know saying, my three-year-old likes little boy clothes and I don't know what she's doing. I'm like, oh, let her wear little boy clothes, who cares? <laughs> okay. So this statement is, is crazy. Look at what information they give to you. They may prefer clothes, toys, and games that are commonly associated with the other sex and prefer playing with other sex peers. Like seriously? This is, this is how we're going to determine what our children are going to agree when they grow up? Is that they like toys? Again, we'd have a whole lot of dump truck drivers if that were the case. So uh, this is, I think this is an interesting piece that, again, our biopsychosocial spiritual thing. What's another answer to what they're saying is this biological indicator that because they like clothes of the opposite gender, maybe they have gender dysphoria as a two-year-old. The other indicator is that from a psychological standpoint, they're trying on different roles. They're trying on different kind of social experiences. Okay, from a spiritual standpoint, they're trying to understand their relationship with deity and and they, they do that a lot of times through parents. Little kids learn to understand God through their parents. Right? I mean that's like parents are so critical in that spiritual teaching. And so one of the other examples of okay, maybe they're not struggling with gender dysphoria, they're just trying to understand the world around them. And they're three. Okay? There's some danger if, as parents of faith, we panic when our three-year-old dresses up in the opposite gender's clothing. 
there's some real danger there because then the three-year-old's like, whoa, I was wearing mom's shoes and she freaked out. What's the deal there? And the little boy's kind of wondering, what just happened? I don't really understand this. And so one of the things that we need to communicate with our um, believing peers, our friends of faith, is it's okay for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds to kind of play around with this idea of gender because they don't have abstract thinking enough to make it concrete. From a developmental standpoint, this statement is in direct opposition with our knowledge of child development. It just blatantly is. Yeah. Because they're thinking of it from purely biological. That biopsychosocial spiritual, if you only look at biology, and if the only factor that determines gender identity is your biology, then sure you can interpret from a two year old what they're being. So this is like a real psychological, like, they're known in the educational world, right? Mostly medical. Fifty years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems to that's why I put the statement of Thomas Jefferson in the very beginning. People have decided what facts they want to believe in, and they, they in retrospect, they do these absurd, painful things. As a researcher, it just pains me when they go and they interview somebody who's transgender, and they say. Um, do you know you were of the opposite gender when you were a kid? Say, yes, I did. I dressed up in the opposite gender clothes. Now that you mention it. And they say, see, proves it. They knew when they were two. I mean, that's terrible. But that's how they do things. Yeah. So then why do you and your peer group even <coughs> this stuff? Even do what? Why do you even entertain? Good question. So, Father Henley, uh, he slip. Uh, just uh, if he anyone slipped. has a question, that's uh, that's great and wonderful. I'll just uh, come by with the uh, the microphone so that uh, all of our viewers can uh, hear the question too. So the question was about why, as professionals, do we read this stuff? Part of it is for me. If I'm going to interact with all the people who do believe this, I have to know what they're thinking, and I have to have gone through this and I'm, I actually do this very thing where I mark things up and I say this is in inconsistent with our theories of child development and I have 10 pages of this for you of things where I've made notes and said this isn't consistent with your prior statements there's inconsistency there but people when they get an agenda they push things for their own purposes, not based in science. And um, so uh, for me, why do I do this? I read this stuff for the ability to have conversations like this, to help other people know how to, to talk to the community members. And I read it because somebody in the academic world has to say, wait a second, hold on. Um, if we aren't doing the talking, we only, we're allowing them to be the only people talking about it. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm going to do some questions, but I put a lot of stuff in here about, you know, puberty and time frame of identity. They make this statement that gender dysphoria will disappear before or early in puberty. This statement is absurd. Because remember, identity is something that's going to begin about the same time you begin puberty. So to say that their gender identity is completed at the start of puberty is completely inconsistent with what we know about the research about identity in general. Okay, So I, I want to have time for some questions. So I will just pass this on to you and then be 
very willing. Please, um, we'll do some questions here for a minute, but please, if you have, you look through this and you say, you know, you put this one note that says why and I don't know the answer to it, please email and contact me and, and I'll give you all that. So questions specifically, yeah. Just a second for the mic. First question, <clears throat> how long have you been in practice? 16 years, give or take. When did this come to the forefront? I mean, you didn't deal with this 16 years ago, did you? No. 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 Um, you know, I, in terms of transgendered and gender identity in public conversation, it's really only been, this is going to sound bad, but it, the transgendered community kind of rode along the coattails of the gay lesbian movement of same-sex marriage. And so as soon as the um, Supreme Court decision was made about same-sex marriage, you saw this dramatic shift in public discourse about gender and attraction and arousal go from same gender attraction to transgendered individuals and gender identity. So really, there's been a massive explosion since that Supreme Court decision. I, I just want to tell you this has been the fastest one hour lecture I've sit through in a long time. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. I, <clears throat> I've always wondered not everybody, obviously, has this gender um, wondering which struggle. sex they, yeah, struggle, because I never did. <coughs> I always liked boys, and I knew that's what I, sure. so what causes a child, or what affects that child, some children to have that, and others not? That's a good question, and in, in reality, we know that the, the percentage or the kind of prevalence of kids who are struggling with this is really somewhere between 1% and 3% of the overall population. So between 1% and 3% of kids will, at, at some point during pre-adulthood, will struggle with gender identity issues. Now, the number of kids who struggle with identity issues in general is much greater than that. But you're right. You know, 95% of kids aren't going to struggle with this. And, and it's a complicated thing. You know, my heart goes out to kids who do struggle with it. it, it especially in today's world where we've disconnected um, relationships from morals and values, in, and especially in media. Media has really disconnected relationships from our values. And it makes it hard for kids who maybe have a predisposition to struggle with it or have had early experiences in life that have been traumatic that made them, uh, that's, attachment's a big one. I, s I see a lot of attachment problems where they were abandoned by a parent or where they were abused by a parent or something happens and they either desire that connection or they rebel against that connection so it's a your your question is a really hard one to answer and I don't there's not an answer that's why I was talking about the biological psychological social and spiritual if you can think about it in terms of each individual what went on biologically for them what went on psychologically socially what was their what was going on in their world and spiritually it, the answer probably lies in a combination of those four things in some ratio. It wasn't a good answer because it's a, it's a complicated thing and there isn't a good answer. And as we move forward with things like this NSAA decision, it's going to get worse. Yeah. Yes, I'd like to know you said that six that it's a six to one ratio that the girls, the boys will be girls. What's the other, what about the girl that wants to be a boy? 
Well, six to one is, is for every one girl that wants to be a boy, there are six boys that want to be a girl. The, the frequency of that is really about three in a hundred boys question whether they want to be a boy or a girl when they're children. So what about the girl that wants to be a boy? You said the boys look up to their mother, so what do, what do they do? There's, there's um, really a lot of interesting debate about that. From a biological standpoint, there's a people like this group that's going to say, well, it's just biology. Mm -hmm. The other side is going to say there was something about early attachment from the social standpoint, there's something about early attachment where they made a connection with their opposite gender parent or they lacked a connection. So if I had this, this girl come into my office, say I'm really struggling with this, I would talk to them about how their relationships were with their same gender parent and opposite gender parent. I would talk to them about any trauma that they had in their life and who did that trauma, whether it was a person of the same gender or whether it was a person of the opposite gender, and what they internalized from that. Yeah. I've, I've heard doctors, uh, medical professionals, and teachers comment that in the last two or three years, they've seen like an exponential number of children that they, that they have under their care. Who, who identify as having these transgender problems, and some of them have opined that it's instruction that they've received, the, the suggestion about this, um, for example, in some comprehensive sex education courses, or looking at the Bruce Caitlyn Jenner story, things like this. What, what do you think of that power of suggestion? Is that true? It's huge. It's huge. It takes somebody from a, a point where they're saying, I don't feel necessarily like the other boys in my class. I feel confused about this. And then they watch TV and they're like, oh, yeah, maybe that's it. And then they go to their parents, and their parents either react by saying, you know, maybe you're right. When you were two, you really liked girls' clothes. Okay. Or parents react by, like, freaking out. And so the parents' overreaction can, can make kids feel like, whoa, what's wrong with me that mom and dad really freaked out about that? And so being stable and supportive and encouraging is important. And this, this um, thing that I will send you with my notes on it, it, it has a segment in there where it's, it's talking about be careful that what's motivating their desire for changing their gender isn't something psychological. But then it turns around a few pages later and says, never question the kids' concerns and confusion. Always encourage them to keep it as an option. And so one of the, the first treatment for adolescents is that's is delaying puberty, is, is a hormone that delays the onset of puberty. And the intent of that hormone is to give them time to figure it out. Now, seriously, a nine-year-old's going to figure it out in a couple of years. It's, it's a dangerous thing. Okay, so there's three different kind of medical approaches. There's the... Um, delaying puberty for adolescents. There's the hormone replacement that intends to masculinize or feminize the body, so it's a testosterone or an estrogen replacement. And then there's gender reassignment surgery, which is um, plastic surgery reconstruction of our biological, the parts that make our gender biologically. Right? And so what happens when you start to go down these paths where it goes from, I'm confused as a kid. I mean, how many of us, if we look back, didn't have moments where we were confused 
about who we were and why we did stupid things or why, I mean, that's, that's normal, right? But if media says, embrace it, go for it, and the only voice they hear talking about this transgendered identity is media, that's the only voice they hear except for parents and other people who say, don't do it, it's crazy, it's scary, and we don't have legit conversations, we're in a dangerous place. Thanks for your excellent presentation. Uh, I'm curious to know what sort of reaction you get from others in academia when you challenge this, the common secular orthodoxy in this area, like the, as expressed in the article showed. I think one of the things that I've had to learn how to do very carefully is that challenge. And so I don't say, that's a stupid idea. I say, now, help me understand this. You think that you can tell at two that they're going to have gender dysphoria, but our child development theories says that they can't think abstractly at two. Help me understand how those two things are consistent with one another. And then that conversation as it develops, it either turns the person into, well, I just think that's the way it is. And they own that it really isn't based in science and academia, it's their personal opinion. Or they kind of monkey around with wonky science of like thinking about when they were two and they used to wonder that and now they know why they're transgendered. Um, so I, to just tell people that that's a stupid idea kills the conversation. And that's, uh, that's a similar reason that I put the Thomas Jefferson thing. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of finesse to challenge people who are vehemently encouraging kids to just go with this, get the hormone replacement, um, plan on gender reassignment surgery. Um, it, it's, it, you have to be very careful backing into it. If I can just follow up, I, I would be yeah, very please. grateful if you can provide um, other sources, either academic sources or uh, professionals like yourself who are challenging this as well because we haven't been able to find a whole lot uh, of professionals who are challenging that, that orthodoxy. So if you can provide those kind of resources, it would be very helpful for us who are challenging this in the public sphere. You bet. Yeah, I can pass those on to Father Sean and he can, he can forward them to you, yeah. So um, just wanted to get a clarification in regard to statistics. Um, you know, we often, and myself included, use statistics to, uh, to help to give a scenery and uh, we also like to create sceneries that are more amendable to our own positions. Um, in regard to how um, they find the percentage of those who have um, gender dysphoria, uh, it sounds like that's based upon um, not, uh, have you ever had a clinical help for that, um, you know, pre or post pubescent, but more, um, you know, did you ever wear your mother's shoes when you were growing up? Did you ever do anything that was associated with, uh, typically associated with the other gender? Uh, in which case that would fire up the um, the numbers uh, dramatically. So, um, do you uh, do you have references of of where those percentages and numbers come from? Yeah, and some of the percentages that I showed you on this article that that I was critiquing, um, <clears throat> I tracked down the original reference. And one of the quickest things that you can do when you hear someone cite a reference or statistics is to ask them where they got it. So just what just barely happened with what with me is you want to find out where they got their information, and um, because it's a whole lot different if you say, "Did you think that you were a boy when you were little or a girl?" In retrospect, it's completely different than taking a random group of kids. And so the numbers that that I was talking about. It's difficult to find good statistics mm -hmm. because numbers is the name of the game when it comes to statistics. And if you're looking for transgendered children, 
how do you find transgendered children? You either find them in a clinical setting where they're seeing a therapist or a counselor because they're struggling with something, or you do retrospective stuff. And so most of the stuff that I've been talking about today has been clinically diagnosed gender dysphoria among kids and adolescents. So a therapist said, you are struggling with this. It, it's really hard to find statistics uh, that are credible. Mm -hmm. I, I'll give you a good example. There's, there's a study that the, and without getting too far off into the weeds, it has to do with um, sexual orientation. And they said that there's no statistically significant difference between children who grow up to have same gender attraction, who had parents with same gender attraction, or kids who grew up in heterosexual household who go on to have same gender attraction. So it doesn't make a difference whether or not the child grew up in a gay or lesbian household, whether or not they will grow up to be gay or lesbian. Okay, so this was the research. If you look at the statistics, they did the study with about 25 people. Okay. So if you look at the percentages, there was actually three times the number of kids who grew up in gay and lesbian households who went on to identify as gay or lesbian than there was who grew up in heterosexual households. But if you've only got 25 people, it's pretty hard to show a statistically significant difference. So you're exactly right, Father. We have to be good consumers of statistics or the person who's using them will couch it in a way that paints the story they want to paint. Mm -hmm. And that's another tactic in terms of how do we have public conversation about this issue. We ask the people, I really want to look at the study that you're talking about. Where is it? I want to look it up and find it. Google Scholar has an impressive amount of access. Yeah, Father, did you have another? Thank you very much for your presentation. Have you had an opportunity to view the uh, research that was done by UNL, the survey particularly um, that was trying to demonstrate the need for uh, protection in business for sexual identity or gender identity and sexual orientation? Have you had a chance to review that survey? And if so, any input that you could provide? The, the research, and I haven't, I haven't looked in depth. My exposure to it was on UNL's look at the awesome things we're doing website for the day that it came out. And um, my sense of it was that it was hypothetical in nature. And one of the problems with hypothetical research is um, well, I'll give you a, a real palpable example. If we do research on parenting styles, and we ask a whole bunch of people who don't have kids what parenting style they use, they all show out to be phenomenal parents. <laughs> you know, they're all just encouraging and supportive and warm. And then you ask a group of people who actually have kids, and they're like, man, I lose my temper all the time. So if you have that kind of research and you're asking these hypotheticals or you're not actually evaluating real circumstances, I'm always skeptical of how much I'm going to interpret this as a real issue. Well, I took a brief look at it, and one of the things that I found to be an interesting observation of the 100 plus questions asked, they were quite generic. So do you feel like people need to be treated fairly in the workplace? All of us would concur, yes. But they didn't ask any questions, do you feel that it's right to fine a business owner? Right. Those kinds of questions. And so um, what I hear you saying in hypothetical, I guess I would agree, and just wondered if you had any input. Yeah. I Thank think you. One of the things that researchers often hide behind is the assumed objective nature of research. And remember that the statistics are objective, but how I got the numbers that I got 
is completely subjective. The decision of what instrument to use, I choose what instrument I want to use to show what characteristic I want to show. And it's very easy to phrase questions in a way that answering them has a clear social preference. So I agree with you 100%. It's important when you see stuff like that to, to kind of drill down and say, what questions were they really asking? Because it, that was really close. Yeah. It's really, you can really get messed up by statistics that are twisted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you again. The, as you noted on the NSAA Board of Director policy that's been adopted, um, it would require that the student go through a process to show they have a consistent gender identity. And yeah. you mentioned early on that it's really a bad idea to lock in an adolescent in a gender, in a gender identity other than their biological gender. Um, could you go into a little more detail about the risks and the dangers involved in doing that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they categorize the um, interventions because one of the things the NSAA has said is that they have to have been engaged in a, and this is where the NSAA's language is um, ambiguous enough that it becomes messy. They have to have engaged in a hormone treatment for at least a year before they can, can opt into the gender program. But what they didn't define was whether or not that was puberty delaying hormone treatment or whether that was masculinizing or feminizing hormone treatment. And there's a massive difference in the impact that it has on the individual. So if you read the literature about the puberty delaying hormone, it says that it is completely reversible. Okay? So what happens is it delays the natural course of your physiological development, but it doesn't alter the, the trajectory that you have. Okay? Now, so on the biological standpoint, is it reversible? Yes. From the psychological, social, and spiritual standpoint, a kid who's 14 and hasn't entered puberty, there's some serious psychological, social, and spiritual impacts that that decision is having on that individual. And so if you look at risks, what are the risks? The, the proponents that I was talking about their article, they say there's no risks associated with puberty delaying hormones, that it's, it's completely safe because they can stop at any point and their body will kick in with puberty. Well, we know that that's really overly simplistic. The, where the real um, risk is when they take the next step, where they're taking the masculinizing and feminizing hormones, where they're taking estrogen and testosterone. Because there is research that looks at individuals who have taken that for a period of time and then stopped, and it, it has a negative, it, it, your body doesn't bounce back. Your body gets used to the level of, of feminine and masculine hormones that, you, that you're internalizing. And it, so what they call that is they call it partially reversible, which means you could stop taking it and your body will try to recuperate but there's going to be some long-term impacts, okay? And then there's irreversible, which is surgical procedures. That there, there is no way to reverse the impact of that, right? And so one of the real big concerns that I have is because NSAA didn't define what their hormone replacement is, what if a kid thinks that they need to be on the hormone replacement and not just the puberty delaying hormone, then they have the risk of impacting. The other thing that it does is it puts this uh, horrible time frame because it says you have to be on this um, drug for a year before you can transition to the other um, activity. 
Well, if you're an eighth grader and you're struggling with your confusion, there's an unnecessary boundary that says you probably want to start the hormone as an eighth grader so when you start high school, you can already start in the gender that you want to play in that sport. That's a dangerous age because an eighth grader is 12 years old. They're barely getting into kind of identity development. There's no way at 12 they have the um, capacity to make these decisions. And some of the research, even by this agency that's very progressive, um, they're saying gender reassignment, the irreversible um, sex change operation, should never happen to a minor. Should never take place for a minor. So you have to be of the age of adult before you can legally consent to having that um, surgery. And they suggest that you should be at least 14 before you start the masculinizing or feminizing hormone. Um, so right there, even this massively progressive um, agenda agency is saying, better not be doing it as an eighth grader. So I'm, I'm concerned with how that gets operationalized. Yeah, I'm just going to use you. my Oh, this N, Nebraska, N S A A. Did they have you on that board to make that to write those policy procedures for our young people? No, they did not. Um, I'd like to say that it was a collaborative effort of a lot of good professionals, but I think it was an administration decision. <laughs> I think it was a policy. Uh, decision, not a um, treatment decision. Uh, does anybody know the specifics of that? I really honestly don't. Um, I, I know they didn't ask me. Um, my understanding is um, that it was largely um, the, the executive director working with their legal counsel, and their legal counsel, I do know, uh, consulted and considered WPATH as a um, authority and referred a lot to their, their material in terms of coming up with their, their solution. Great. Lawyers. <laughs> Just kidding. You're a lawyer, right? <laughs> and, uh, other questions? Oh, 